Christy, great to have you on Conversation with Cats. It's, I think, one of the most wonderful things about this pandemic has been uh, getting in touch with old friends again, since we're all at home and not wandering into bits of the planet with, you know, in the field. We're so looking forward to having you here. I know um, your passion for years has been um, elephants and rhino conservation, and but you have done a lot of work um, with tigers and in tiger habitats with WWF International. So please tell us how did this interest start? What is the work that you've been working on? And tell us a little bit about the role of WWF International uh, with tiger conservation in um, South and Southeast Asia. Over to you. Thank you for having me, Latika. I, uh, I mean, I'm happy to like see, meet and see you virtually though. After so many years, I think like no, our paths have crossed since like 1995, is it, in WII, so it's great to this one. I look forward to seeing your series as well. I mean, it's really interesting that you're using this time off to do a series to like, you know, educate people. So, I mean, I will, I, I've been working for the last 20 years all across Asia in the elephant and tiger range countries. I've pretty much been in every single country except for Russia or in the tiger range uh, areas uh, now and uh, during this journey it's been wonderful but like no i actually started my my expertise is on elephants i did my phd on elephants from Raja G, as you know uh, and Raja G. corbett and then i started this job running uh, all of wwf's conservation work coordinating conservation work on elephants and rhinos and then um, from 2008-9, there seems to be a lot of poaching going on. I mean, and uh, not just of elephants, rhinos, but also of uh, tigers. So I thought, like, let's look at something like you know, places that I knew. Is it true that people are all saying, oh, tigers are going to disappear within the next few years and most of its range and things like that. So I said, what does the data tell us? And so I looked at like, you no, know, because I'd been involved in Nepal and in 2001, the Suklafanta was identified as one of the highest density tiger areas at that time. They recorded 28 tigers in a small area, which is about 300 square kilometers. And uh, Kaziranga, the work in Kaziranga had not started. Kaziranga is known to be the highest density tiger area afterwards from the data. But this was definitely like you know, a place with a lot of tigers. And then in around, then the civil war broke. There was a lot of poaching of rhinos and uh, tigers going on here. And so when we looked at the data, in 2009, when I actually started looking at it, there were only about like you no know, seven tigers left out of the 20. I mean, where it started with 28 tigers in a 300 square kilometer area, and it had come down to like about seven tigers. And the poaching was very rife; they were seizing a lot of snares, things like that. And this was one area where we had been investing on rhino conservation and tiger conservation as WWF. And I kind of felt, wow, this is like really a steep decline. And and of course. Um, I went back to my old study site to like, you know, because if you were and Rajaji as you have been, like, you know, you see tiger pug marks in every single Nala and Rao in Rajaji when I was doing my PhD between 1996 and 1999. Anywhere you go, any, any water hole you go, you would see tiger pug marks. And the thing was, there was about like, you know, seven or eight tigers that were recorded during that period. There was breeding, there were cubs were seen, tigers have been photographed by people like Adway at Kills. And then I started hearing rumors that tigers have disappeared in Western Rajaji. And we are talking just about Western Rajaji from the from the area between Ganges and Yamuna and uh, to near the Mohan Road. And then uh, this was the year that, uh, you no know, Terai Arc on this big concept where we were going to like, you know, connect all the protected areas across the Terai into a single thing had taken off and WWF had played a big part in the thought leadership on this idea. And yet, uh, I was hearing 10 years later on, or 10 years afterwards, I was hearing that there was just two female. And so when I started asking for data from WI, they said they had camera trapped intensive, really intensive camera trapping, running over 200 cameras for many hundreds of thousands of nights. And they only had two females left on the western side of Rajaj. This was my light bulb moment. And it was like it led to a internal campaign within WWF, which I called uh, you know, Stop the Bleeding. And I kind of like, no started rallying all our internal people saying like well, something's seriously wrong and thing we need to address and so I was asked to kind of come to our global leadership where all the CEOs meet once a year and that happened in Bonio that year in 2009 and I was asked to come and like run two workshops for the CEOs to talk about this 
whole uh, Asian flagship species crisis. There was rhinos being poached, uh, Sumatra rhinos had declined uh, very badly. The last Javan rhino in Vietnam had been found dead with a bullet in its leg. So there was a lot of things going on and I said like, no, we need to stop and like, no, something's happening and we need to like refocus. Around the same time, we had uh, the year of the tiger and so WWF had that just then I mean, I would assume that part of my campaign had some role to play in this, but they launched this big program, which was Tigers Alive Initiative, which was du to double the number of tigers in the wild by the time the next year of Tiger came around, which was in 2022. And I'm sure you are very deeply involved in the efforts towards heading towards the event in 2022. And this is where like, no, so then I um, became the country director of uh, WWF in Myanmar and uh, as you can see, tigers in Southeast Asia are uh, in a pretty bad shape. Like there is hardly any population that you can say stable. Like, there's only one stable population we could say that's in the Thai Myanmar border in a landscape called the Dana Tanasaran. Every other population is declining, be it in Mal Peninsula, Malaysia, be it in Sumatra. And you, then you have the Indochina area, which is uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos where there is uh, Cambodia's last tiger was recorded, I think if I remember correctly, was either 2005 or 2007. There's been no tiger recorded in, in Vietnam for a long time. And I last heard that Namit Phu Lui, which was like Rajaji, which had about eight to nine tigers when I started work in 2000, is currently has only one female in that park, which is bordering uh, China, bordering Vietnam, up in Northern Laos. So there is a big crisis of tigers, I mean, on tigers going on in Southeast Asia. So in in the sphere of work that I'm currently doing, I mean, I, have of course, spent three and a half years as uh, the country director of Myanmar, where we did a lot of work on, on the Donatanasram landscape. And one of the main reasons why tigers are going in Southeast Asia is the snaring crisis, right? You have snares, any forest that's unprotected without patrolling or even with patrolling, you will find snares. And a simple example I can give you, there's a small protected area called Hui uh, Forest in uh, Vietnam, community protected. I think it's a state forest area. And between 2011, 10, 11 to 2019, they've removed about 127,000 snares. Roughly 14,000 snares every year is removed by the ranges that we fund. That means that like every month they're removing over a thousand snares and in these forests, nothing can escape and we don't have a hundred percent detection rate on snares. So imagine how many, whatever is left is killing. So they are basically, you have an empty forest syndrome. So that's what drives it like, you no, know? so you would have tigers being victims in the snares, but you also have tiger prey being like completely decimated by the snaring crisis. And this crisis is the one that we need to address at this point in time, which is what we are focused on in all the sites we work in. And of course, as I said, the Donna Tanasarim is a 183,000 square kilometer landscape. It's huge. It's stretching all the way from northern Thailand, Myanmar, down to uh, no, the Malaysian, nearly the Malaysian border. It's um, it's it's got like you know, it's got almost all the cat species uh, species that have been recorded in camera traps, and it's got a tiger. It's got possibly the only remaining tiger population that's been stable or showing some levels of increase through like no dispersal. So you have actually tigers. That same biggest source site, Weka Keng on the Thai side, has been protected for many years by the Thai DNP with technical support from WCS. And this is the place where you have breeding tigers and you have tigers dispersing regularly out. And we now have evidence that tigers that have dispersed out of the source site have recolonized areas in Myanmar, for example. So that is where we think that there is a lot of hope in that if we put in work with communities and we do work with a Karen indigenous groups on the Myanmar side, we work with Thai DNP on the Thailand side and, and we are trying to improve the patrols, improve the removal of snares and also working with communities to like you know, try and reduce the hunting and poaching uh, this one. So we hope that like you know, eventually this will be a stronghold for tigers in Southeast Asia. The other big idea we have is our Eastern Plains landscape. This is again another huge landscape in uh, uh, Cambodia, eastern side of Cambodia, with a little bit into Vietnam, and it's the largest dry forest in the whole of Southeast Asia, or in the whole of Asia, I would say, the largest stretch over 2 million hectares. 
but tigers were pushed out of this area completely but we've been working for the last 20 years trying to build up the prey and it's been a big challenge the snaring is a big issue and other things and one of our big ideas is to bring tigers back to this uh, landscape and i think that's something that we've um, been focusing on recently our, our global ceo wrote a letter to the prime minister of cambodia making a commitment to invest millions of dollars if they would commit to keeping the space inviolate so that we can bring the tigers back it's just been with the poaching and everything on an increase especially for bush meat during the pandemic time in india we've also been um, really thinking about what we need to do uh, i was just be talking to some friends who work in the the field that you will know as well and um, they were saying that there's concrete evidence that though tiger poaching itself is not gone up but the lockdown of the last 3 months and the economic um, impacts of the lockdown are leading to a great increase in bushmeat poaching in india so this is uh, you know something that has been recorded and documented so um i wanted to understand from you how does this um impact on species like like you said you know that the the rhinos and the elephants as well do they also get impacted by the by the snares and by the poaching what ha- what is happening in southeast asia we have some evidence that elephants have been uh, affected by ssis like no collateral damage not as a direct uh, direct target but like you no know, through snares like their trunks getting caught or calves having their like you no know, legs getting caught in snares we've also had evidence that some you know, elephants do get shot sometimes uh, when they're doing conflict raiding but the poaching is very much targeted toward bush meat and bush meat in southeast asia is a very relished uh, delicacy it's very expensive it's more expensive than chicken or mutton and it's largely being po- poached to satisfy an urban consumer i mean uh, like no more affluent consumers who travel on their big suvs along big highways and eat in these restaurants so it is a very much commercial in nature i would say the the poaching crisis that you see in southeast asia we are not talking about people who are hunting for subsistence right i mean that that would be very little very i mean it may not be little but it may not be having the big effect good. that commercial poaching is having on bush meat yeah so christy what uh, is there a possibility of actually farming these species to provide things like venison for this sort of commercial enterprise is that an option because many countries do that in fact like countries like Myanmar do allow commercial breeding of species like sambar for example or bucking deer and uh, do this but you know this is the challenge we have with tiger farms right i mean the, the argument for tiger farms is we could breed them and we could put them i mean then they could supply the demand so if you were a millionaire let's let's look at the human psychology right mm-hmm. if you were a millionaire you want you like go to a farm you buy tiger bone or whatever meat and you serve to your guests and then you see a billionaire saying i don't want to be with a riff raff and i want to do something well so in your dinner you want a wild tiger right so it's yeah. it's like somebody drives a ford and somebody wants to show off with this bmw or a ferrari so okay. that, that, that and there are just not enough species so the wild species will always have a premium because in people's mind they think i mean even us like we pay more for country chicken than farm chicken right yeah right. So, so that differential is always going to exist excellent okay so th- i think this is a really important point to point out to people um the other um thing that i i mean i was wondering is today we have the perfect opportunity to actually talk about not eating um bush meat because of the spread of zoonotic disease like sars like ebola and now like covid 19 right. So are you planning a massive campaign along those lines because I think this could be possibly uh the biggest push that we could get in that direction. Yes in fact today like WWF is launching a campaign to like you know, to reinforce this message and in Southeast Asia especially um with Alison who's on the call here like we are launching an effort to, because we've never had governments in the state i mean wwf and all conservation organizations have been talking about the threat of like you no know, uh pandemics and like you no know, disease jumps from spillovers from animals to humans but nobody took it seriously and i don't think even we believed in it that it would happen in our lifetime right we kept talking about it and now it's happened and it's put people behind like you no know, like you have countries that have lost their economy i mean like this 
not even 10% occupancy rates of hotels in places like Thailand and Cambodia and Myanmar. The garment manufacturing industry has been decimated uh, because there's been no demand. I mean, this is the first crisis where you had a demand collapse and a supply collapse, right? You've never had a recession where that both have collapsed together. It's usually one or the other. And um, so I think governments are in the right state of economic damage and health scare to listen to a message now. And uh, we are we are strongly pushing on this. We are our team in Vietnam, for example, is talking with their prime minister's office to looking to get a like a very strong directive to like them ban the ban wild meat. One of the challenges we have is that if you go with a blanket ban, that like no the enforcement may not be so strong. So if we are looking to identify high risk species and taxa and have the enforcement efforts targeted at them and also not rely on the traditional forest departments or environmental ministries to do it, but to have the health ministry look at it from a health angle and do this enforcement. So that's our plan in Southeast Asia at least. Okay, so also explain to me because this is a question I get asked a lot. Um, we do technically have the potential and the ability uh, to take really small populations of tigers and actually deer tag all of them, you know, um, and, and then have um, an, a remote way of, of actually monitoring movement uh, to make sure that we know where every tiger is at every moment. I know it's terribly invasive and, and I understand how invasive it is, but when you have you know, seven tigers left in a landscape and you want to protect them. Uh, couldn't we actually do things like that? And why is it not being done till now? I think it's easy to do it in the dry forest where tigers are a lot more localized and you um, you can like you know, when, the, when the summer comes around, they will be in round the water holes and you can do that. And I think you can do it in Sutlafanta, for example. I mean, now the tiger numbers are increasing in Sutlafanta as well. But, um, or in Weka King, where WCS has done that a lot. They've read, I mean, it's one of the largest radio tracking studies of uh, tigers in Asia. But when you start getting into uh, rainforests and more mountainous forests, it becomes a challenge because like when we put it, and it's also a law of uh, diminishing returns, right? Like the lower the densities become, the higher you have to camera trap to just get a tiger in your camera traps. Like for example, we run hundreds of nights of camera traps to get one tiger picture. Whereas if you run hundreds of nights of cameras in a jungle in India, for example, like Corbett or like no Kana, you get hundreds of images or probably 200, 300 uh, images in that period. Yeah. And so that's the challenge. Like, no, how do you then capture the tiger? What about thermal imaging? So the biggest challenge with thermal imaging is that's restricted technology. And most of the countries we work in, we cannot export this technology to, right? We've tried. And we, I mean, even to try and get to test these things, we've tried. And like, no, when you buy them in the US, you have to sign a declaration that you won't export them out of the US. So I think there is lots of technological challenges with regard to law, bringing them. First, you have a challenge of exporting it from the country. And then you have the challenge of taking it to a country where you don't know whether you're legal or not. Okay, so I'm going to actually bring this point up because I'm talking with someone this afternoon talking about the law, implementation of the law and and how you know the legal system can support or hamper um, wildlife conservation. So I'm going to bring this point up. So the point is, I mean, and, and to just sum it up, technology exists. We're lacking in political will. We, we also have country politics and legislation that may not allow us to use appropriate technology to take the, the steps that we need to take. Is that is that correct? It's very correct. And if you look at it like, so you just look at tigers, right? Yeah. Which are the countries in the world that tiger conservation has been successful? So you have India, obviously, you have Nepal, you have Bhutan, you have yeah. Thailand, and you have Russia. Yeah. To the five countries where we've succeeded and why have we succeeded in india nepal and nepal for example because you have a very strong civil society pressure right one tiger gets poached that um, the head of national park director's life is made miserable right so much so that in india very smart people don't want to get posted as directors of national parks because they know their life will be made miserable you know, i mean it's on the news it's on tv it's on social media you take Bhutan and uh, Russia, for example, you have strong lead. I mean, you have leaders who are very much invested in like the tiger conservation. They want to make it happen. Thailand has been like a, a outlier because you had one site in which the DNP and WC has invested years and years of effort to make sure the tigers like you know, really thrive there. And now the Thai society, since it's reached middle class, is very active on tiger conservation. 
So they are reaching what India has been like you know, for many years. So in Thailand, if a tiger gets poached or the news of some seizure happens, it's all over the news and there's huge pressure on the government. Like you no, know, it's on social media. Pulled so much so the government actually thinks of it as a political problem. In all the other countries where we are struggling, tiger goes extinct. Nothing happens. I mean, Peninsula Malaysia, Sumatran rhino went up, it's gone. Not a single head roll. Nobody even got a tap on their wrists. So this is the problem, right? When, when pull, pull, you basically need the political will. That political will either comes from a personal political will. I mean, personal interest like Putin in Russia, or you have the civil society pressure. If that, those two conditions don't exist, it's really hard to make tiger conservation happen. Okay. Wow. Yes. So, so tell us something more. I mean, when you say that some countries are doing really badly. Is it possible to actually reintroduce from captive populations? Are there captive populations in big enough numbers to allow rewilding of tigers? Because earlier, um, you know, when we were studying, there was this whole belief that you couldn't rewild captive bred tigers. But now, of course, um, in India, we've actually proved that you can do it. It's not the ideal situation, but it can be done. So, do you have that option in uh, Southeast Asia? Many governments are talking about it. Like in Cambodia, they are talking about like you know, using captive stock. But one challenge is what captive stock? I mean, most tigers in captivity are like you no know, interbred between various subspecies. And uh, I'm a pragmatist. I, I mean, the, there was even an argument saying like, you no, know, is uh, how can we bring in a Royal Bengal to an Indochina? Like, for example, they were talking about taking tigers from India to Eastern Plains, Cambodia. Eventually, that's the discussion going on. And some people saying, oh, this is the Indochina tiger range and you shouldn't be bringing uh, the Royal Bengal. And I, my thing is like, no, once a tiger is gone, how does it matter what subspecies you bring back? Yeah, I think it's like, no, you should look at the ecosystem function of that apex predator. That's what it matters. Nothing else. I think the challenge would, is always going to be like, no, how do you, if you fence a large enough area, I think you can succeed. But to bring it back to landscape level, I think you would need political will. You can perhaps like you no know, succeed in a smaller. I think there is will in like places like Cambodia for private conservation concessions, like the type of model that Africa, African Park runs. And uh, I think it's possible if people have deep enough pockets, somebody big wants to invest in it. I think it can be. You can try that experiment. Perhaps it would succeed, and I would be very happy if it succeeds because having any tiger, whether wild or captive, is better than having no tiger at all. Fantastic. We shall remember that and see how we can uh, do something with that. Okay, coming back to, to India, there's this whole hype about, um, you know, an actual counting of tiger numbers and we've gone up and we've gone down, we've lost two and we've gained three um, and all this goes up. But um, from my experience, most of the tiger numbers that we get are from uh, protected areas. And uh, we're not really, we, we, we extrapolate to areas outside of tiger reserves, but we're still discovering new populations and sizes of new populations, especially um, in places like the Northeast. So do you think that we actually could have a few more tigers than we think we have? Um, and that's why areas like Chandrapur now, um, there's this whole conflict, you know, because there's so many man-eaters and um, there's this whole population spill outside of protected areas with no place to go to. And what, do, what would you recommend for places like that where you have this population spill happening? So, I mean, so India has like two challenges, right? You have tigers, like you just described, like living closely with people and people somehow tolerating them. But I think there will be a time when that fabric gets stretched beyond a point And then like, you, know, you will have, I mean, you do see that like in people, when somebody gets killed, there's retaliation, poisonings and things like that. It's also a fact that there are more tigers now in India than when we were like doing our PhDs, right? There are places with like, which we knew didn't have many tigers are like, Teaming with tigers outside Corbett, outside the, you know, uh, several areas in Tamil Nadu, outside Nilgano, no, Mudumala Wildlife Sanctuary, in the Tingamara area, which have all now been converted to wildlife sanctuary. So that is that is definitely true. There are more tigers, and I think it's largely due to the extra protection that tigers have received within protected areas. Our biggest challenge happens to be Central India, which is one of our biggest populations, because that's where tigers are completely overlapping with people. So my uh, thing is, I would look at like, so you have a situation like Rajaji, for example, Western Rajaji, which has no tigers at this point. Now the two tigers, two females, one of them. 
So and there are plenty of empty forests in northeast India as well. And what I haven't seen is an effort, uh, like a systematic effort, to try and look at it as a long-term systemic problem, not just the five years some officer is there and interested, but to have a big vision which says, in 50 years' time, we want this habitat repopulated, rewilded with tigers, elephants, and other things that were, that existed there before. And rewilding definitely has to be part of our uh, our conservation ethic because large parts of the world have been converted, and I think. Now we have a chance with people, more and more people moving to urban areas and people, places emptying out, even degraded areas can be restored. And I think we should be thinking about these tigers as can they be part of that rewilding program and where can we do it. But in the end, I think like, no, I always say in places like Sweden, like, no, the wolf kills sheep and the, they kill the sheep, the farmers kill the sheep back. In India, like, no, elephants and tigers kill human beings and yet the government will not declare them rogue till like seven or eight human beings have been killed. And so there's a great deal of tolerance, but I think we need to be more proactive in these places. But also, I think we have to understand that at some point in time, some of the tigers might become urban tigers, like our Andheri, I mean, like the leopards in uh, Borivali. So, yeah. And they will learn to live. I mean, they will learn to live off goats and dogs and things. And we need to figure out what the compensation mechanisms for the people living with them. Okay, so is it possible, Christy, for now, let's let's just talk about the year of the tiger 2022, um, to actually come up with a plan, say for WWF, with many of its partner organizations like WCS, to actually come up with a plan, showing a map, showing where we have high tiger populations, places where we could possibly reintroduce and move them to, and actually put this out to get public opinion on the on the matter and actually get pressure on the government to go ahead and do this. Do you think we could plan for that? I think definitely that's an idea and you know that that currently WWF, WCS is leading the effort actually but WWF is part of the coalition with several other organizations working on tigers. They are doing the tiger conservation landscape version 3 at this point in time. They are redoing mm -hmm. the whole analysis and you are probably part of that uh, grouping as well. Yeah. And that's that should be talking. But that's that should be uh, talking about the idea of restoring tigers, right? Yeah. It's not just about yeah. holding on to tigers where we have, but it's how yeah. can we now expand yeah, because, that? Like how because what I've been finding is that it's a, a small group that works on this, but the information is not out there for people. So yeah. I've not heard these discussions. So I'm on, on groups, for instance, with most of the naturalists, good naturalists from across the country. Okay, and these are subjects that we should be talking about. Yes, it's important to talk about a little insect, but it's also important to talk about rewilding. And we need a more concerted effort um, to bring this information out into the public domain where people can see it in the planning stage, not see it after you guys have come up with a plan and we just get to know saying, okay, this is the report, we've come up with the plan, we've gone to the government. And that's unfortunately what's been happening, you know. I'm so, not involved in the directly in these things, so I think it'd be best to talk to the tiger. I mean, I mean you, I'm sure you will be talking to Stuart Chapman, the head of our tiger's yes, alive. Yes, and yes. The question you can bring to him, because he also, I know, I mean, we've been friends for a long time, and he strongly believes in the rewilding concept. Yeah. And I think as human beings, for us to leave a planet that still has the wildlife that we experience, we have to think of rewilding as an important tool in the conservation. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So there was also, um, I don't know if you know, but um, in the same Chandrapur area that I was talking about, uh, absolute central India, uh, the the, PC, the CCF has got so desperate because of the spike in, in uh, human conflict that he's actually talking of relocating 50 tigers. He's talking of if we can't relocate them, can we sterilize them? Have you seen all this news? No, I'm not being party to this. Uh, you need to look this up. It's um, it's quite extraordinary that this conversation was taking place. But it's actually really scary, Christy, because not more than 10 days ago, 11 people being killed by tigers in one day. Not, not over an extended period of time, but in 24 hours. So the spike in human conflict has been huge. And then, of course, there was this whole conflict with the the poor elephant in Kerala, and you must have yes. read about yeah. that. And the fact that people are now resorting to homemade 
you know firecrackers and bombs and and i've seen that being used in madhya pradesh a lot um so do people actually um use things other than snares i mean is is human conflict a problem in uh, places like myanmar how how bad is it or are these populations more in isolated remote areas you know also southeast asia like no in more advanced countries they use more like no like sometimes they might use guns and other things in other places they will use more crude explosives in southeast i mean in places and elephant they bury put them in like no fruits for example and the elephant goes and eats the fruit or they could put be they use pesticides in fruits and i know in northeast india pesticide has been used uh, to poison elephants and you had all groups dying back in 2001 um, thing i haven't heard of recent incidents in northeast india but this was i'm talking back in 2001 and i was still working in india and uh, yeah i mean i think this is uh, it's a challenge that we have and i think governments everywhere are struggling they see conflict as more reactive everywhere governments and i think what we need to change the mindset is like governments need to become proactive they actually need to have like whole units of conflict mitigation i think one of the states that really has it really well is north bengal for example years ago i've seen them like you no know, very proactively deal with the conflict which is why they were around that population has been growing for years now feeding on like you know, good crops because <laughs> they live in such tiny fragments of forest and their main food is like you no know, actually rice and like you no know, wheat and other things so yeah i mean i think that's that's the challenge and i don't think we've cracked that yet it's also a challenge in poor countries like you no know, what do you invest in because this is all cost money and uh, and i think um, there is a need for uh, for a rethink on how we deal with conflict because currently the entire conflict spectrum whatever it is it's snow leopards or tigers or elephants or bears it's all reactive at the moment and we are not thinking about like no and also out of the box innovative solutions like no like you talked about geo tagging could we set up geo fences i mean like no i for my dogs i have an electric uh, Yes, absolutely. We train them, uh, yeah. not not to go near the rabbit cage because they've been killing our bunnies. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So they like you, know, you see them avoiding the rabbit enclosure when they're walking past. So I mean, I, and I I see no reason why we can't try it with larger mammals because it would mean saving the animal from dying and saving humans from dying or yeah. preventing crops from uh, this one. But these are radical solutions. Immediately, like, the problem is like you no, know, you'll have all kinds of animal rights. People who poorly understand science and things like that. coming and then like no they all come at different angles they all passionate people but the thing is when they don't understand the issue then the whole thing gets clouded and then it goes to the court in countries like us and so it's yeah. it's messy and i think we need some kind of word. like you said i mean i think a dialogue and dialogue with including every stakeholder at the table might be the way to start it fantastic okay so going completely to a different direction because this is again something that's um very very important and unfortunately um though it was gaining momentum it suddenly got put on a back burner because of the covid pandemic um climate change and global warming tell us what uh, wwf um has been doing to combat climate change and global warming and its impact on species like the elephant like the tiger like the rhino which are you know umbrella species for a habitat so how does it work so one of the things like i mean i let me talk i mean i am i'm not a climate change expert i mean i know the basics but not a climate change expert but so we've been looking at adaptation as a way to like or mitigation as a way to uh, deal with it so for elephants for example one of the big issues we had in kuiburi national park in thailand was the elephants used to go outside to drink water from the reservoirs and things like that and would drain the pineapple crops for example and so during the dry season what what we in the project where we did was we created salt lakes but we also created whole water holes right next to them we actually this area was just outside the national park but still considered to be part of the national park in terms of management so you were allowed to do things so they took an approach where they considered lantana as crops that we don't want and grass as crops we want so they brought in big uh, tractor tillers they like you no know, basically uh sowed and like you know, planted grass they planted like exotic grass species that elephants can still eat and so this really resulted in a 50% drop in elephants going out and raiding so you could already see that like you no know, in the dry season if you provide water and if you provide food the the incentive for an elephant to take the risk of going out and being chased and being shot at it realizes it's a smart animal and it doesn't want to go through that when it can satisfy its needs 
and so those are the things and uh, and we are also like you no know, working in several areas looking at impacts we are we are engaged working with scientists in modeling like you no know, what's ha- what happens to like species as climate change takes hold but it's still a very um, it's still uh, what what i wanted to say was that this discussion is still at places where it's still very scientific and technical nerds and wonks speaking it's not it been translated to actually like you no know, things that's like the problem. About, i think yeah, that's like, that's the biggest issue with you know that i've been discovering while doing this series because all of us talk in scientese and we're very happy with it and we have access to all of this but if as a lay person you even go online and you want to access a a publication many journals are just not available you just cannot access information so i think that's why a lot of people resort to uh you know pre you know armchair preaching and coming up with their own versions of things which is like you said not based on a sound scientific foundation and and therefore things go into these weird extremes with everybody shouting so is it actually possible for organizations like wwf to increase uh, the amount of information they are putting out um, for people to see and act as a coalition uh, point for getting all the information together and putting it out you know on these issues i think it's a very valid point i think we already do quite a bit but i think this is this is a very valid point and i think well, i will take it back to wwf to our climate uh, program and say like you no know, what can we be communicating more simple in more simple language and how like you no know, as related to species i mean i have a colleague in the us called uh, nikhil advani who works on this a lot in both in africa and asia and he's looking a lot at mitigation and adaptation so he's another person i can like introduce you to i would love that yes so great actually working on specific projects that deal with this and looking at like you know what happens and modeling like you know how to do this but having a, like a field component so that you can actually test what you're seeing that would be amazing um we've also been looking at um you know i mean i don't know if if you've been keeping um abreast but in india we've had you know a lot of national parks in the news in the northeast recently and you've seen um what's been happening with the oil spills and uh, you know you've seen um how how two or three major national parks in the northeast are under threat either from flood uh, from flooding because of the creation of dams or from oil spills and um i've been looking at the the oil spill pictures and it's horrendous because you've also seen species like the dolphins getting affected and it's it's not just terrestrial mammals so is wwf actually doing something about issues like that are you involved with this at all no because my remit is like you no know, starts from the border of india from myanmar all the way to south pacific and north to mongolia so i have not been involved i mean as a i've been involved because like kashmir yes. has been fighting, i mean been filing yes. legal challenges to it in yes in a personal capacity but i i mean i'm not aware exactly what the wwf of india program i'm sure they are like you know, because they are present in northeast and they are working on these issues but i don't know the exact but do you have similar issues in southeast asia as well with the um, huge development projects coming in and um environment um people not building uh, the right sort of measures into programs right from the beginning so i mean i i you know what i keep telling people is it's not about putting a bandage on the wound or stitching it up after it happens it's actually preventing the injury from taking place so are you um involved in any with any government where you have a say in huge development projects and can guide them as to how to build in effective ecological measures to make sure that there's not a huge disaster does that do you do that so the I, i i don't know whether we have a say in it but we are engaging with all governments every country we work in we are looking at like you no know, large infrastructural project like dams roads and things like that in myanmar there's a road that go runs from um, the dawai port to kanchanaburi in thailand and uh, so we've been working very closely both with the authorities on the thai side and the myanmar side uh, in helping them with their environmental impact assessment comments on the environmental impact assessment and and clearly many of these assessments are fall far short of what what would be ideal and so we provide data like we do camera trapping for example and like you know, we provide them data of the presence of animals we give them comments we tell them like you know, in mitigation what kind of structures do we need and like you know, where would we would done a lot of modeling looking at like animal crossings for example 
and saying like no way we could do that in cambodia the um, wwf uh, worked a lot with the government to convince them to put a moratorium on the sambo dam which is now under a 10 year moratorium it was supposed to be started this year and that would have like really uh, had a huge impact on the irrawaddy dolphins in cambodia in the mekong and uh, so the, uh, the argument was we presented a lot of uh, alternatives and we brought investors to a renewable energy summit for example that wwf co-hosted with the government and so eventually the government decided they would put a moratorium for now and we think in 10 years we would have the technology and and things like renewable energy would become so cheap that it would not make sense to go down the path of dam so i think we basically bought ourselves a thing but we also have challenges i mean there are some strong governments which don't want to listen to you we can uh, we talk to their investors but if the investors come from china or uh, this one we talk to our office in china if they come from singapore we talk through our offices in singapore so because we have a global presence we do a lot of back uh, working in the background right we are not the guys who are out there with the banner shouting against it because there is yeah. a role for them absolutely yeah. there's a role for them yeah. we see our role as more working with the government and trying to convince in the back rooms rather than taking a public stance on many things so you but, work to change the system within the system not yeah, again so there have been instances when we have not been successful from within the system and then we go out and campaign mm. but we give it a full try we go through the whole range of being a responsible global conservation organization we feel that we have to go through the entire uh, we have to have all the options on the table and not just one okay so the other i mean i think um you know one of the other things that strikes me about southeast asia is that most people would go to southeast asia for tourism but other than you know somebody saying okay i want to go to see orangutans or something people don't really plan a trip to go to thailand to see like a tiger so how much role does tourism play in wildlife conservation in southeast asia is there a huge role Yeah you've come to my favorite story in uh, about tourism in Thailand. So I went to Kangkrachan National Park and Kulguri in 2005 was my 2004 or 2005 was my first trip. So there is this place called Panantum which is now closed that part is now closed for public but that used to be open for public till about 3 years ago and it's like you climb the mountains you climb up the mountains and then when you're up there you and you wake up in the morning you wake up to the calls of the gibbons and, uh, and you wake up and you see the entire forest under your feet covered in clouds and you see the hornbills you know flying over that it's a fantastic sight to wake up to and i in 2005 i remember i and there was one tourist who was a hardcore birder who had pitched a tent and we were out there on panantum and i have to say 4 years ago i went back to the same site there was 150 cars on that uh, suvs on that uh, plateau and the tents were pitched night and you couldn't get out of your tent without stepping on somebody else's tent so it's huge and i mean the wildlife tourism has really exploded in thailand and a large part of it is driven by domestic tourists it's not foreign tourists mm-hmm. just like in india tiger tourism is driven by like you no know, photographers and domestic tourists so i think uh, where people have started seeing animals it's become it's really exploded local communities are benefiting from it i mean in kuiburi national park when we when i was talking about this water and salt lake and things like that the elephants are easy to see now and so the local communities now rent their jeeps uh, act as guides and they're earning money and from those things of course covid has not put a stop to all that stuff but hopefully it'll all come back but in thailand it'll probably come back faster because it's totally dependent on domestic uh, tourists rather than foreign tourists so i think like no if you if you can like and that's a good example like no and it's I, we have also seen that happen in vietnam with primates some of the primates because vietnam has this 17 species of endemic primates right and so people are starting to see but it's a whole cultural shift first you have to become more affluent and then you want to like no you start seeing that's the shift that's happening slowly wow fantastic okay because that's that's good to know and um it's also so yesterday i was talking with um someone in in the us and we were talking about um the small populations of lions in africa in countries where there is desperate need of tourism uh just to give them that little bit of a a boost saying okay the world hasn't forgotten you we remember you exist and we're willing to come in and and give a little bit to the community uh because we're visiting you um so i think it's it's a, it's a really good point and i think people need to understand that they can plan these trips now uh to 
places like Southeast Asia, which are not, um, you know, the other end of the planet because people are traveling like to South America, um, which are huge long flights, which may be a difficult thing, um, you know, but here we're right there and we can go easily and and uh, we can have these holidays, which are, um, you know, longer period holidays. And uh, so now tell me, um, what is what is the situation with WWF and this whole talk of COVID spreading to uh, wildlife? You know, what have you discussed this at all? Because we've seen it in, in captive populations, but there's been no proof in uh, wild populations yet so we are talking to veterinarians we put in place protocols like for example where we are where our patrolling teams for example patrolling teams that we support government patrolling teams that we support or uh, you know, community patrolling groups that we support we put them on like you know, personal protective equipment social distancing we put in uh, we, we are starting to roll out regulations with regard to how can how close can they approach for example uh, primates in uh, Vietnam, for example, should they be approaching them close or should they be far away? Should they always wear a mask? So we are starting to get into that thing because we realize that this is definitely a danger and primates being very close relatives of ours could possibly potentially have the same impact that we are seeing on humans. Yeah, yeah. So we are already starting to um, do this now. And, uh, very good. Yeah, I mean, we are in the process of discussion. So it's all like, no, do this. Uh, we are like learning as we go and like adding more and more. But these protocols are being written as we speak. Great, because um, there was a bit of a scare here in India. I don't know if you saw it um, in somewhere in Meerut. Uh, there was a doctor who had a bag with samples taken from COVID patients and a wow. rhesus macaque grabbed the bag and ran away with it. And they didn't know whether he had broken it or got infected or what had happened. And those are the sort of things in urban environments which really make you understand just how great the danger is because uh, you know it's just it can be such a, a huge outbreak i know that um, in tigers it the impact wasn't so uh, severe and they did recover um, so did the leopards but uh, with primates it can be a whole different all thing good. altogether yeah yeah well christy thank you so much i mean we could chat forever um please put me in touch with um those people and it would be just lovely and thank you for doing this you're it's welcome Latina, and we'll make sure that you get the presentation once allison has a chance to look at it yeah thank and you thank you for having me on your program thank you thank Bye. you We are relocating. Our focus is, you know, I don't know what is going to happen next day.